Wow, 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 unbelievable. This is outrageous. This is outrageous. I can't believe how many people are here. How many of you snuck in? Be honest, you didn't pay. Come on. How many? Look at this. Unbelievable. What a huge blessing to see so many friends, so many, uh, so many new friends, so many old friends, and a couple of former friends. Let's be honest. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, yeah, this is uh, it's a little bit of a strange experience for me because, as you know, we've been doing Socrates for lo, these 22 years. That doesn't seem possible, does it? Um, and that's in earth time. A lot of stuff that I'm going to say tonight, it's in earth time. I want you to know in advance. Uh, but, but seriously, we, we have not, uh, we've been doing these for years, and we've been doing them usually in this room. But as you know, for the last two years, because of the monkey pox, uh, <laughs> is, that is that stuff nasty? Dar darn those monkeys. But, uh, but the monkey pox has really, uh, it's, it just has changed our lives. How many people are struggling with a monkey pox rash right now? <laughs> they just sort of bubble up. It's really nasty. It's nasty. Don't put, whatever you do, don't put witch hazel on it. I can't get into it, but whatever you do, don't put witch hazel on the monkey pox. Don't do that. Um, so the last time we had an event here was, I guess, with Peter Thiel. So that's, it's about two years. Well, you know Peter? What? Um, it was with Peter Thiel. Anybody, who was here for that event? I'm just curious. So look at that. So some of you were, were, were here for that. And um, that was, uh, yeah, it's over two years ago. Anyway, well, I'm just so glad that we're back. I'm actually thrilled. I, I almost don't believe it. Thank you for coming. I know this was an awkward time uh, because obviously yesterday was Memorial Day. Am I getting that right? Was it? Yeah. yeah? And so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a weird time. People are afraid uh, to go, come into the city because of all of the murders and stuff. And you know what? <laughs> come on. Like, you know, it happens. So what? You get shot, you get shot. You know? You, you can't really take it so seriously. It's, uh, yeah. So anyway, because of the, the, those things, you know, I know that a lot of people were, were worried about coming into the city. And I should ask before we get into this, did anybody get shot or stabbed before you, before you get... We're trying to take it back to, to Dinkins era quality. You remember, anybody remember Mayor Dinkins? You, you remember Mayor Dinkins? Right. We're, try, we're trying to bring it back to that. We're going to get subway uh, graffiti back. And, uh, and, a lot, and a lot of, you know, more stabbings and just generally because it was kind of a grittier, the city was grittier in those days. And we don't like the fact Disney took it over and we want to bring it back to the crime-ridden days of David, David Dinkins. If you go to the Socrates website, you can see so many different kinds of, of guests that we've had. Everyone is different. Because of the Socratic method, right, asking questions, we tend to frame the evenings as a question, you know, uh, and so... Uh, we want to ask the question like, you know, is faith compatible with science? Or we had Dick Cavett here. We asked, what's the price of fame? You know, we asked those questions tonight. Uh, we're going to be asking the question, framing the evening by asking the question, you walked on, on the what? <laughs> That's my question. Excuse me, you, you walked on the what? That's the question. And we're going to explore that as the evening unfolds. Uh, Actually, it is kind of weird because normally when I introduce someone here, you know, I, I kind of go down their, their resume. We don't really care about Charlie this or Charlie. Like, he walked on the moon. Like, that's really all we care about. That's the only credential. So I don't know if you, if you have a CV or resume, but at this point, that's all you need to put, to, to put on it. But when I read on the resume that uh, Charlie Duke had walked on the moon, I have to tell you, I thought, you know what, I'm not buying this. People put a lot of stuff on their resumes. You know what I mean? <laughs> In these topsy-turvy times, people just don't throw stuff on there. Like, who's going to check? You know, they, they, they put it on there. And so I have to tell you, when I read that on Charlie Duke's resume, I was like, you know what? I wasn't born yesterday. I'm not buying this at face value. I'm going to ask him some questions. You know what I mean? Some hard-hitting journalistic questions. Because you know what? Anybody could claim that. And a lot of you have claimed that. And I know, I know for a fact you didn't walk on the moon. So... You know why should Charlie be any different? So we're going to ask. We're going to ask. Uh, we're going to ask those questions. But anyway, that's what it says on the resume, and we're going to explore that tonight. So now I had a problem on the. Uh, this is, to my mind, an historic uh, gathering because it is 50 years ago that Charlie Duke walked on the moon, and to me, 
that, uh, I don't know what that does, but there's something, I guess if you're old enough to remember 50 years ago, which I am, you realize, wow, that's, that's a significant amount of time. It kind of does something to one's head to think, where was I 50 years ago today? Uh, and I'm pretty sure I was building a tree fort in the backyard. <laughs> I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure, but I don't know. No, I, I do think it's an amazing thing to think, all, you know, some of you are far too young uh, to remember what happened 50 years ago, but it's, an, it's just an amazing thing. And when um, uh, Heidi Duke, which is Charles and, and Dorothy's uh, daughter-in-law, we were talking and she said that, so I had the privilege, uh, and you can go online on Rumble, uh, of interviewing Charlie on the day of the moon landing, which is about a, about a month ago. But I said how wonderful it would be if we could have a Socrates event and do it around the 50th anniversary. And 59 years ago tomorrow, Charles Moss Duke and his wife Dorothy were married. Congratulations. Yes. Yes. That's, uh, man, if I had to like speak at an event, you know, the day before some big anniversary, my wife would kill me. She wouldn't put up with this. But obviously Dorothy has put up with a lot. Um, but that's just amazing. 59 years tomorrow. Congratulations. That's wonderful. But 50 years ago, um, I, I was actually trying to think, because I, I have a dim memory, the Godfather had just come out. Does anybody remember when that happened? Anybody here old enough to remember when the Godfather came out? So it, it is kind of amazing. To some extent, it seems like yesterday uh, uh, to me. And you'll be interested to know that Elton John came out with Rocket Man in 1972. Yeah, exactly. And he wasn't writing it about Charlie. He just was writing a general song about, about you know, some guy in a rocket. And that very year, my guest tonight was at the top of a rocket. And he's going to tell us about that. Um, or he will be carried out by gendarmes, because I want to know that this really happened. We're not making this up. All right, so the problem I had when I interviewed uh, Charlie on my radio program was, what do you call him? Because he said to me, well, you just call me Charlie, because he's a very humble, kind man. Uh, he's enduring this introduction, for example, so you can already tell that he's a sweet, <laughs> he's a sweet soul. And I thought, what do, you, what do you call him? So I looked it up, and you know, he's, um, he was made a brigadier general in, uh, in the Air Force, although he, he was started out in the Navy. Naval Academy, all right, take it easy. You'll get your chance, Charlie. <laughs> this is my time. In 1979, so I said, do I call you General? So I thought I could call him General. But it is kind of a funny thing. Uh, I thought, what do you call him? You know, I was, I was mortified by that, because I thought, if I'm going to be sitting up here, what do I call him? And I, I should share with you, some people call him the space cowboy. <laughs> Some people call him the gangster of love. <laughs> Some people call him Maurice Rant Round. Because <laughs> he speaks of the pompatus of love. Because <laughs> I'm a picker. Come on, I'm a grinner. I'm a lover and I'm a sinner. I'll make my music in the sun. Um, you know, that's kind of weird. It's like a spirit of Steve Miller just came over me. Is there Steve Miller in the room? I'm just curious. From Minnesota? Where is he? There he is. Steve Miller from Minnesota. You, by the way, you, you get the Golden Hubcap Award. But are the Blattners here? Do they show up? The Blattners. You're also from Minnesota. So, you, so you're going to have to split the, the Golden Hubcap Award. Anybody here from farther away than Minnesota? No, where are you from? No, you're, you're from like Mars. Don't, don't, it's always my friends that, that pipe up. Anyway, um, I, I apologize to, to, to the real Steve Miller to, to the, to the, for, for singing that. A, a couple of um, Union League Club housekeeping issues before we get started. Uh, as you know, during the event, uh, positively no spitting. If... Uh, once the event's over, 815, you, you spit all you want. But just respect, respect the club rules. As you know, already know, there's a strict dress code. Some of you struggled on the way in. Uh, they, uh, they have, the last time with Peter T, we had a very, um, was, who was it? It was my friend Rich Egan. Where is he? Is he here? Rich, because they have a strict, you wouldn't know this, but they have a very strict no chaps policy. 
And um, Rich is from New Jersey, and he thinks, ooh, I'm going to Manhattan, you know, and he's thinking glitter and fun, and it's like, no, it's the Union League Club. They don't, they don't do that. They don't do that. So uh, in future events, please keep that in mind. Now, I've already told you uh, really everything I think you need to know about the man who lets me call him Charlie. A warm Socrates in the city round of applause for Brigadier General Charles Moss Duke. You go in the far chair right there. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right, I better get this out of the way right, right off the bat. <laughs> Did you really walk on the moon? Be honest, because you're among friends. If it didn't happen, there's forgiveness. But is that true? It's true. Uh, right, about uh, 20 years ago, there was a, the moon landings were big hoax. And I was interviewed by somebody on NBC. And, uh, and I said, as Katie Couric, and I said, Katie, if we faked it, why did we fake it nine times? <laughs> <laughs> you're going to fake something, do it once and shut up, right? But we went to the moon nine times, had six landings on the moon, and I was the uh, fifth landing of the six. So, I don't know though, if you really wanted to be clever, you could, you could do it several times just to throw people off, you know. <laughs> Charlie, it's, I'm not kidding, I go places and I talk, and every now and again I will bump into someone who is a flat earther. Yeah. And I realize this because I would use it as the ultimate example of what we all dismiss, we don't take seriously, and there are people like they're out there. Mm -hmm. So um, have you ever encountered one who actually thought that you were, that the, 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 who, who confronted you personally and said this never happened? Uh, I, my first encounter with this fellow, I don't remember his name now, but uh, uh, he called me in the middle of the night and he said... Uh, How'd he you get your number, Charlie? I, do, we were in the phone book, actually. Yeah. All right, that's on, that's on you. That's on you. Not many, not many phone books left, but back 20 years ago, uh, and this call me, called, he says, my name's so-and-so, and he says, uh, Did you walk, are you Charlie Duke? I said, I'm Charlie Duke. He said, well, you claim you walked on the moon. And I said, yeah, I walked on the moon. He said, well, I have irrefutable proof that you did not land on the moon. And I said, well, why don't you send me some of this irrefutable proof? <laughs> so I hung up, and he sent me a, a grainy video that he'd done, and it was uh, a fake video, actually. And uh, so anyway, I saw him, uh, a friend of his uh, showed up at a meeting in, in Japan, yeah. I don't believe Japan exists. And, and this guy, <laughs> and this guy approached, uh, Buzz Aldrin in his office in LA one time. And he said he had a Bible in his hand. He says, swear on this Bible that you've walked on the moon. And uh, Buzz said, get out of here. And the guy, kept, <laughs> the guy kept bugging him. And finally, Buzz just popped him one right in the, <laughs> right in the middle of the nose and knocked him down. And uh, get, so the guy sued Buzz. Uh, but the Lawyer says, you deserve it. Get, I mean, the judge says, you deserve it. Get out of here. So. Wow. We need more judges like that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I had a similar experience uh, in uh, Japan and with this guy. And, uh, but the evidence is irrefutable that we landed on the moon, uh, that we did. You don't need to convince this group. We, yeah. we believe okay. you. Yeah. It's kind of why we're here, because well, we mean, believe you need this. an argument. Uh, the rocks are totally, 600 pounds of moon rocks are totally different than earth rocks. Uh, the photographs that we took, you cannot fake photograph that. Back in those days, you didn't have the technology to fake photographs like you could do it today. 
And so the photographs are all real. The rocks are real. The experiments we brought back, we left a laser reflector up there, and it's all, all that's being transmitted. I mean, you can... So we can hit it with a laser from and, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's evidence uh, is overwhelming that uh, the moon rocks are real and that we did land on the moon six successful times. I want to ask you a few geological questions, which is not typical of me, but um, I, I want to get into that. But first, I, want to, I just want to go backwards. Um, you know, I was kidding around about the idea that once you've walked on the moon, you know, uh, you know, people don't really care where you went to college or whatever you're, you know, you've been published in the Atlantic Monthly or whatever it is because, you know, but how did your path go? I alluded to the fact that you started in the Naval Academy. So you didn't even have it as a gleam in your eye to, to be an astronaut because in, in those days... In those days, there wasn't a space program. Uh, we were trying to launch rockets, but not, nobody was talking about people. And so I graduated from the Naval Academy in 1957, and there wasn't an Air Force Academy in 1957. Uh, there wasn't? They, they started it in 1955, but the first class wasn't going to graduate until 1959. So up until that point, they would allow West Pointers and midshipmen to volunteer for the Air Force, up to 25% of the class. And so I fell in love with airplanes and, uh, at the Naval Academy, and so the, uh, the, uh, the decision was naval aviation or Air Force. And uh, I was leaning Air Force, but I really didn't know. So I, I took my physical my senior year, first class year we called it, and I said, uh, and the doctor after I got finished, he said, well, Mitch and Maduke, uh, uh, you don't qualify for naval aviation, but the Air Force will take you. <laughs> <laughs> so I- That's that, true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> True story. And so I ended up in the Air Force, and uh, the whole story was, the doctor says, we have found a astigmatism in your right eye, and you don't qualify for naval aviation, but the Air Force will take you. So, so anyway. They're, they're desperate. They're just getting started. They'll take anybody. Yeah. <laughs> did you, I mean, I have to ask you this question. As a kid, did you ever have any inkling or premonition that you would do something like go to the moon, or, or was it simply completely, uh, you know, because I, I grew up at a time when I was a kid, people started going to the moon, so I can't think of a time when <laughs> nobody was doing that. Well, I, uh, I'm 86, and I can remember Pearl Harbor. Uh, I was six years old, my a twin brother, and uh, <clears throat> it was a very, I can remember it vividly, and so my dad went off to to the Navy and, uh, at 35 years old. And uh, we ended up in South Carolina with my grandmother uh, and uh, my mom. And, uh, and my heroes were that greatest generation, as Brokaw calls it. And so I wanted to serve my country. And I chose to go to the Naval Academy because, and because my dad had been in the Navy. And I, I, I was... I, as a kid, I can remember making these balsa wood planes and th uh, throwing them off the uh, front top story of my grandmother's house, and, and we could get some matches and we'd light the tail and we'd throw this thing <laughs> off. And, so it was like the zeros crashing, you know. And so I can remember those kind of things, but uh, certainly it wasn't any. Uh, I fell in love with airplanes, I guess, in those days, and I had this adventure spirit. Uh, I call it, and uh, there's a, uh, a book by Dr. Seuss uh, called uh, Beyond Z, and it talks about this kid who learns the alphabet. On and, Beyond Zebra. Yeah, Beyond Zebra. On yeah. Beyond Zebra, yeah. And uh, his name was Conrad Cornelius O'Donnell O'Dell, <laughs> a very young man who's learning to spell. The A is for ape and the B is for bear, C to C, uh, through to Z, Z is for zebra, I know them all well, says Conrad Cornelius of Donald O'Dell, but he almost fell flat on his face on the floor when I picked up the chalk and drew one letter more. For the things that I see and the things that I do, I could never spell if I stopped with a Z. Wow. And,
Now, that wasn't my life, but it was my kids' lives, you know. And uh, as I read this and so on, by this time I was already in the Z, beyond Z, because I was an astronaut. And uh, I uh, was successful uh, as a fighter pilot. I went to Germany in 1959 as a fighter interceptor pilot. And uh, so you, you took your, that's before, uh, that's before you were married. Oh, that was, yeah, uh, five years before I got married. Right. And uh, so we, uh, I was serving over there and on the way over or sometime in that early part of 59, they picked the first group of astronauts. Uh, NASA was uh, formed and so the space age was beginning to bubble. And, uh, but I was too young to inexperience, I thought. So until, uh, uh, and then in 1961, which was a very exciting year, they were building the Berlin Wall. We, high alert in Germany at that time is in my squadron. And uh, Yuri Gagarin went up in April. And uh, then two weeks later or three weeks later, Alan Shepard went up. And two weeks later, President Kennedy going to announce that we're gonna go to the moon. And ha ha, yeah, sure, it was five, four, three, two, one, blow up rockets instead of <laughs> lift off. And so rocketry was in its early stages, but we were flying people into space. And uh, so uh, uh, I, I literally laughed at him. You know, 15 minutes in space, and he's committed it to the moon. And the most amazing thing in my life, I think, other than walking on the moon, was eight years and two months later, I'm in mission control talking to Neil Armstrong when he landed on the moon. I, well, <coughs> I want to, uh, I, I just want to remind folks because I don't assume that they know this, but that was one of the amazing things to me as I was looking into your life. You know, not only did you walk on the moon 50 years ago with Apollo 16, but you were seminally involved in Apollo 11. And uh, I want to, I want to get to that in, in just a minute, but let's just, Let's just carry through. So in the 60s, when, when Kennedy makes that statement, it does seem preposterous yeah. that by the end of this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. And it's kind of like, I mean, I, I guess you, you, you maybe can tell us what happened at NASA, because to me, you know, we all know there are leaders like that, right? They say, we're going to do this and this and this, and then their staff has to get it done. And the staff says, this is crazy. We'll never be able to, to do this. And I wonder, was that the case? In other words, did, when Kennedy made that statement, uh, you know, giving himself eight years and change to pull this off, was there a sense at NASA that this was possible? Or did he throw this out there and then they had to play catch up? Uh, I think it really came from NASA. Uh, okay. the, there was a letter written by Werner von Braun uh, who headed the rocketry program at NASA and also for the Army. And uh, Kennedy or somebody at the White House put out a, 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 how can we beat the Russians? How can we win the space race? And Von Braun wrote this big letter uh, to Kennedy and he said the only way, and the summary was the only way we can beat them is beat them to the moon. And so, so it came from Werner von, von Braun, Braun, former Nazi, yeah. recruited by us. Yeah. You knew Werner von Braun. Uh, yes, he, I, I was, uh, my first two or three years, one of my additional du duties in the astronaut office was to uh, uh, go attend his staff meeting and monitor the development of the Saturn rockets. And uh, so Stu Russo and I would fly up to Huntsville, Alabama, spend uh, half a day in his management meeting once a month and fly home and then report to, to the astronaut office. So we got to be friends and he was really a wonderful guy, great inspiration to me and uh, a tremendous, uh, uh, tremendous individual. And so I, I got really excited. These guys really know what they're doing. And, uh, and so it- But this is before you thought you would be sitting on the top of one of these rockets blasting off uh, into outer no, space. I, yeah, I did not know that I was going to get to ride one no, at that point. I like the way you talk about riding it. <laughs> you make it sound like something other than a rocket. Yeah. Um, okay, so at what point in the 60s did you get a sense 
that you would be an astronaut? Uh, I was at MIT uh, in a, a master's program in 62, uh, and uh, I was not doing very well, but the Air Force kept pushing me on and encouraged me. And, uh, and my senior year, uh, my second year, I should say, uh, I was uh, looking for a thesis project. And, ne and MIT actually had the contract to build the Apollo Guidance and Navigation System. And they had designed this system to be able to uh, inertial measurement unit. And you, you get it aligned properly, and, and you fire the engine, it's going to burn in the right direction. So they built this system, but they didn't know whether anybody could work it or not. So they needed a pilot to do it and, and, and see if it was feasible. And so another Air Force officer and I did that. And, uh, uh, and, and we developed this, that we were developing the capability of an astronaut to fly the system or to operate the system. And uh, I, met, I met these astronauts who were coming up to monitor the development of the system like I did later on for the Saturn. And uh, I'd never met anybody that was so excited about their job and so enthusiastic. And I, so I said, how did I get that job? And they said, well, get your degree and then go to test pilot school and you might have a chance. And so I, uh, Dorothy, uh, Dorothy and I were married at that point and, um, and, and I said, should we go to test pilot school? And uh, we all agreed that that's what I should do and so I got selected and, and, uh, and let's see, it was uh, June of 1964, I'd gotten my degree and we headed to California to test Edward to the test pilot school. And there I worked for uh, Chuck Yeager. Uh, he was the uh, commandant of the school at the time. Uh, and uh, very enthusiastic and a very good motivator, a good mentor of mine. And uh, so anyway, I graduated and, uh, and, and he put me on his staff. And that was in uh, August of 1965. And the next month, I, in September, I read an article in the front page of the Los Angeles Times saying NASA's looking for more astronauts, please apply. And I read the, the, the qualifications. I said, hey, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's about 3,500 other guys, but uh, I applied and got, was one of 19, got selected. So first chance I, I applied, I got picked. And so that started my career. <clears throat> so. Let's, uh, let's move forward to Apollo 11. Uh, many people here will remember what happened as Neil Armstrong is bringing uh, the lunar module down after he has, what do you call it, decoupled from Mike Collins up uh, there? Undocked, yeah. Undocked, mm -hmm. you sure? Yeah. Uh, so he and Buzz undock. And they're going to land on the moon. It's never been done before. And Neil Armstrong chose you personally to be what? What is it called? Capcom, capsule communicator. It's the only, uh, and it's always an astronaut. And it was, uh, and it's the only person in mission control that could actually talk to the crew. Uh, and they always picked an astronaut because you had to have the astronaut language and mindset. Uh, for this job. And so uh, I had done the similar job on Apollo 10, which was sort of a dress rehearsal for uh, the, uh, the moon landing. Uh, we actually took a, a lunar module to the moon and we started down, but the lunar module was not capable of landing, so they just aborted and came back up into orbit. So the whole team that did that went to work for uh, went to work for uh, Apollo 11. And I wasn't supposed to be on the team. It was, that was the next group of astronauts, but uh, Neil said, Charlie, I want you to do this. So, uh, yes, sir. So it was a great honor so, to be asked. So as he, d d tell, for, for people who don't remember, s say what happened. In other words, he's, he's bringing this thing down. And... Uh, well, things looked pretty good as we started the engine and we started down, but then we started having communication problems, so we had to reorient the vehicle. Then we had computer problem, uh, uh, over, computer overloads, 
and uh, it was giving us warnings as we came down and at first I thought we were going to abort because mission rules said you had to have the computer or you co weren't going to land. And, but uh, the flight controllers that monitored the computer kept hollering, we would go on that alarm flight. And so uh, they knew that the computer was still operating to, to guide and uh, control the vehicle. It was just dropping off some of the jobs at the end of the queue that weren't important. It, it was telling you that, that it was overloaded. So those continued to start, that continued on down. And uh, then at 7,000 feet, the vehicle pitches down so you can see the moon for the first time. You mean that Neil and Buzz could see the moon yeah, from, they, so from they the could module? See, yeah, they could see the moon for the first time. And, uh, and Neil said, uh, we had him targeted into a big boulder field, big rocks, apparently. And he said, we can't land there. So he leveled off and flew across the moon for four or five miles, if I remember, level, at about an altitude of about 500 feet. Well, that used up all the reserve gas. So he, he finds a place and he pitches up, comes down like a helicopter, and uh, it... Uh, but as he's doing this, though, nobody's talking, everybody's holding their breath, because this is, this is a bad situation. He has not yet landed on the moon, and you don't know, in mission control, if he is going to be able to make it. Because that's right. how much gas does... how much? How much gas is in the tank? There is none left, right? There's a few seconds. No, no, it was about 5% left, and our minimum cutoff was 4%. When he got to 4%, we'd call an abort so he would have enough fuel to start positive rate of climb away from the moon. And uh, so the, the flight engineer that was monitoring patrol, uh, uh, fuel said 60 seconds flight. That means he had 60 seconds to land. So if he does not land it in 60 seconds, if he doesn't get past this boulder field, you have to abort the whole mission. That was Be a rule. Because I'm, I'm just trying to follow this. In other words, if you, if you use too much gas, you're not getting off the moon. No, it's a different, it's a it's different, different. engine. Okay. The ascent engine, it's not used at all. All right, okay. so but you, are, but you still had 60, he had 60 seconds to land. And you were all just holding your breath. <clears throat> yes. The tension in mission control was through the roof. Uh, dead silence. Uh, and uh, the, only, the only communication was the uh, flight controller that was monitoring propulsion. He called 60 seconds. I called 60 seconds to the crew. Eagle, 60 seconds. And then 30 seconds later, uh, the controller said, 30 seconds flight, I, I radioed to Neil, six, uh, 30 seconds uh, Eagle, and he had 30 seconds to land. The next thing he heard from mission control was abort, uh, if they weren't on the moon. And uh, so 13 seconds later, according to my stopwatch, uh, I heard contact, engine stop, and we knew they were on the moon. And it's and that is when you delivered your famous line. Do you remember the line? I've, had, I've said it so many times, yeah, I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so after that, it was well, dead. I, that wasn't a yes or no question. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering if you, will, if you will, because not everyone here remembers the line. Uh, you said, twank, tranquility base, you got a room full of guys about to turn blue over here. Is that it? Yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, uh, well, but the whole world was listening well, to Well, first this. off, Neil says uh, there was dead, we were on the moon. We knew that we were on the moon. And, uh, and so Neil says, uh, Houston Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And I responded, Roger Twang, uh, I'm Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. And sure enough, we were holding our breath in the whole room and uh, started cheering a little bit. And, but flight director uh, Gene Krantz got us back to work because if you landed and sprung a leak, you had to be ready to get off right away. So uh, it was very critical time. Uh, but uh, the sigh of relief was 
palpable, you know, and everybody just started breathing again. And uh, when I called 30 seconds, he was probably 20 feet off the moon. Uh, but, uh, uh, and if I'd have called Eagle abort, he may be 10, second, 10 feet off the moon. Hello, you, <laughs> say again, Houston. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Neil Armstrong is not going to abort from 10 feet off the moon, I'll tell you that. Yeah. It would be, uh, it would be a pity to go 240,000 miles and then 10 feet away decide to uh, listen to those kind of orders. Um, well, so you were, you were part of that. And, of course, the difference between Apollo 16 and Apollo 11 is that Apollo 11 did not know even whether it could land. In other words, when you, when you, the module, um, the pods on the module were so huge because this is where we get into the geology, no one really knew what the surface would be like and whether it would support the lunar module as it landed or if the lunar module would just sink into the moon. Uh, we had one scientist, uh, geologist, that uh, argued that the uh, uh, with the age of the moon, it could be 200 feet of moon dust, and you land, you just sink out of sight. And uh, so uh, you had to prove that that wasn't true. And so we sent the unmanned surveyors to land. And the surveyor landing pads were the same bearing, uh, not the same size, but the same, gave you the same bearing strength on the moon that a lunar module would give you. Okay. So when they, they turned on the camera and there was this thing sitting right up on top of the pad, Hi, who, you know, hallelujah, we're gonna be able to land, you know, and everybody got really excited about that. And so, and it turned out that the, the, the footprint of a boot on the moon was the same bearing strength as the, the foot pads on the lunar module. And uh, so it was, it was very, well calculated that we weren't going to sink out of sight. Now you did go in about two inches. Uh, that's the most uh, that uh, we we sank in, and uh, it's all uh, the moon is uh, covered with this very very fine dust like powder, and it's a uh, pulverized rock actually. The moon has no organic material like Earth. It's just a big rock that's been pounded by meteors over the eons and is, is covered with this crushed rock, but it has very good bearing strength. Uh, and you look at it under a microscope, and it's very angular, like uh, sand on the seashore. And so it gave you a good bearing strength. And um, uh, so we uh, uh, understood that. And uh, so we were able to walk around on the moon and, and do the things you're supposed to do up there and, and uh, with, with assurance that you weren't going to sink out of sight. Now the problem was that uh, if you got too close to a steep crater and you fell in, you could not get out uh, because you, it's like walking up a steep sand dune. You, you hop up and you slide back, you hop up and slide back. And so you didn't want to fall into the crater uh, and so you gave it a big wide berth uh, but when we got around these big craters. Well, so obviously uh, Apollo 11 was a great success. Uh, we beat the Ruskies. I don't think they've been to the moon to this day, have they? Uh, they have with unmanned spacecraft. That doesn't yeah. count, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't count. And uh, so, um, obviously, Apollo 12, great success. Apollo 13, h horror story. Um, so 14, 15, 16, there were, 17 was the last one. When did you know that you were going to get to go to the moon? Uh, I, after Apollo 11, I was selected as backup crew for Apollo 13. And uh, <clears throat> so that, the flight rotation was backup, and three flights later you'd fly. So 13 backup, 16 fly, and that's the way it worked out. And uh, we had started training backup. Uh, with uh, John Young, the commander who had been on Apollo 10, and uh, myself as lunar module pilot, and then uh, Jack Schweikert was the uh, command module pilot. 
But as backup on 13, a week before the launch, uh, I, caught, I catch the measles and exposed everybody to the measles. And uh, Mattingly had never had the measles, so uh, they uh, jerked him off the flight a couple of days before the flight, and the guy I trained with took his place. And uh, so Mattingly came back on our, on our crew, and so we trained for the next two years after the flight of 13 together and we flew together on Apollo 16. So you've obviously had time to think about the fact that the measles prevented you from being on Apollo 13. No, I was back up. We were not supposed to go. Okay. The prime crew was composed of Jim Lovell, uh, Fred Hayes, and uh, Tom T.K. Mattingly. And, uh, but, uh, he got bumped off because he was not immune to the measles. And so the guy I trained with took his place. And uh, after a few days training, Lovell said, we're ready to go, and they launched on schedule. So at, when the accident occurred, uh, at 55 hours after the launch, uh, <clears throat> John Young called, and it was about 10 o'clock at night, if I remember Houston time, said, hey, they got a big accident, they got a big problem, we gotta go to mission control. So we all, the three of us showed up at mission control to see what we could do. And uh, 35 hours later, I finally went home. Uh, and uh, by this time, they, they'd, they whipped them around the moon, and we'd done all the procedures to get use the lunar module to uh, get them back on trajectory and around the moon and start at home. And uh, so they, everything was working well, and, but we were a spacecraft that had, was, had the, the, the capability for two guys for three days, now we got three guys for four days. How do you make the oxygen last, the drinking water, uh, the uh, electrical power, all of that kind of stuff. So it took hours and hours and hours to figure all that out, and, but we did. and. Uh, Things weren't going to run out. We we're going to have enough stuff. Turned out the critical consumable was drinking water. And, uh, and we had a, I think we, I don't remember exactly, but rationed down to like six ounces a day uh, to make the water last. And uh, they powered back up. And if, if you want to see an accurate movie about this Apollo 13, go see Tom Hanks' movie, uh, Apollo 13. It's really good. And <clears throat> so uh, they made it back, and then so now Mattingly's back on our crew, and we get announced as Apollo 16. So at that point, you know you're scheduled to go. We're scheduled to go. There's no guarantee you're going to go because NASA could cancel the mission and uh, cancel, like they did, they canceled uh, 18, 19, and 20. There was supposed to be three more after Apollo 17, but they canceled all of those. And so, and uh, why? Uh, they got uh, nervous. They wanted to use the money for space, uh, for space shuttle. And Apollo was a risky program. And if they kill somebody on the moon, it might be the end of it. Uh, all the man could quit while you're ahead. Yeah, quit while you're ahead. And uh, the last three missions brought back most of the rocks and did most of the science. Uh, they, we were three days on the moon, uh, whereas the first three missions were only 24 hours on the moon at maximum. And so uh, we, we had a car, uh, we had uh, all these. Well, let, let's, um, let's start with the, because um, this is amazing, it's amazing. But the Saturn rocket, 360 feet tall, that's inconceivable to most of us here. What, what was it like to get into the cockpit on top <coughs> something 360 feet tall with those engines? Uh, we got out to the white room, which surrounded the, uh, the hatch, and uh, John Young gets in first, and then I get in, I'm on the right side, he's on the left, and Mattingly is gonna sit in the center seat, or lay down. And actually, you land, if you take your this chair and push you over on your back, that's the position you're in, in the spacecraft. And uh, they, just, they strap you in, and, uh, and you just sit, and you wait for liftoff, and, Everybody's reviewing your procedures, but what you're really thinking about is keep counting, keep counting. I'm ready to go. And 
I know what to do, keep counting. And because you got a four hour window to launch. Per month. A month. And if you don't make that four hours, you got 30 days till the moon comes around again to launch. So well in 30 days, and I to say, well, we've decided to cancel this thing and you just had an accident or you did this and you lose your chance. So everybody was saying, keep counting, keep counting. And for us, right on the second uh, ignition, and off we went. So what are, the, what are those G-forces feel well, like? Because so many people have imagined this, you've experienced this. It uh, starts out very slow because you have seven and a half million pounds of thrust pushing a six and a half million pound vehicle. And so it lifts off very slowly. But the, the noticeable part was the vibration. It's like a 360 foot long limber fishing pole and you got somebody down here shaking and it's you're out there on the other end and you're going like this and uh, <laughs> so uh, it uh, you can't see outside because the windows are covered over and uh, and I don't remember anybody telling me it was really supposed to shake that hard <laughs> Every and they want I to got be a little nervous and uh, my heart I could tell my heart was really pounding but John was so calm, we're on our way, we're go Houston, we're go, and Houston, you're go, and so we kept accelerating. And as you burn out your fuel, you, you go f acceleration more and more. So uh, two minutes and 40, no, it, uh, So you don't, you're not just going, you're not saying the velocity is increasing, you're saying the acceleration is increasing. Which is increasing the velocity also. Well, I know that. Yeah. But the acceleration, yeah. as the rocket gets lighter, the acceleration, you're getting faster and faster. Yeah, so what speed do you get to eventually? Uh, it depends on the, the, the first stage of the Saturn uh, uh, had four, five engines that produced seven and a half million pounds of thrust, which was constant. But as you burn out your fuel, the vehicle gets lighter and lighter. So on our mission, it lasted, for, the first stage lasted for two minutes and 40 seconds. We burned up four and a half million pounds of fuel. And uh, we paid for it. That's right. <laughs> so Ker Kerosene and oxygen. <laughs> so what does that feel like now? You are leaving Earth's orbit. You've never done that before. Um, you, were, you were the youngest man ever to walk on the moon. And to this day, you're the youngest man to walk on the moon. You were 36. And I'm still the youngest man. And you're still man the youngest the man. <laughs> um, but the impression I got when I interviewed you for my radio program is that you're so focused on the details and the job that you don't get a lot of time for existential rumination. You're just getting this done. Yeah. Uh, was there ever a moment as you're, you know, traveling 100 and 200,000 miles away from home that you thought about? What well, this I, is. I, it was never spiritual. It was never philosophical for me. It was uh, it was an adventure, and uh, and a and a uh, controlled adventure, if you will, because you have so much to do and you have to focus on your procedures. And I guess the the closest I came uh, of awe and wonder was. We were on our way and we were about 20,000 miles away from Earth and Mattingly's maneuvering the spacecraft and into my window over here floats the Earth. And it's the whole circle of the Earth. And you could see the Arctic Circle down across the US, uh, Canada and the US and Mexico and Central America. And the land was all brown and the snow and the clouds were crystal, uh, pure white and the ocean was this crystal blue and there's this jewel of earth just spent it in the blackness of space. And everywhere else you looked except for the moon and the sun, you can't see any stars because the sun's shining brightly. And, and space is this velvety black. And the pictures that you do not capture from those pictures, the emotion that you have when you, there's the earth, you're out on home as some of the astronauts have called it hung up there in the blackness of space. And it was a, a very emotional experience for me. And, uh, and I, to this day, I can vividly see uh, this beauty of the Earth. But spiritually, on the moon, uh, you know, you're so busy, you don't have time to 
think about uh, things, at least I didn't, and I don't think anybody on our crew did, but uh, there were several spiritual moments at, uh, in Apollo. Uh, the first occurred uh, on Apollo 8, which was the first time we took the lunar module to the moon, and, uh, no, the command module to the moon, very risky mi a mission, and uh, on Christmas Eve, 1968, they had Earth rise and they turned on the TV camera and they, and they broadcast from the moon on Christmas Eve. And, and, they, and they started reading from the, the book of Genesis and they had the first 11 verses of the first chapter of Genesis and all three of them read from that, those 11, 12 verses. And I, except for Neil Armstrong's, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I think that's the most important word spoken from the moon. Was that yeah. the um, you had um, when when you uh, you're you're up there? What does it take? Three or four days to traverse on the this, moon? Yeah. To, no, no, to get there. Three days to get there. Three days to get hours. there. Mm -hmm. um, and so. You're getting there, everything's happening, and then suddenly you're there, and now you have to undock from uh, your friend. I can't remember who was the... Mattingly. Okay, so Mattingly stays in the... Um, and you and Young disconnect. So t talk about this now. Now you, you crawl into this lunar... Well, you crawl into the lunar module, and there's, there's no power in there. It's all powered down. We had, uh, if, if I remember, three batteries, big batteries. And, uh, uh, and <clears throat> so I had a procedure. I was first in, and then John floats over, and I just start reading my procedures, power up the electrical system, power up the, the oxygen system, power up this, that, and the other. And we, it took us eight hours to get this thing up to, up to power, full power, and checked out. And you're still connected no, to the... Uh, well, yeah, we're connected at this point. And when, uh, so we're flying in orbit, Take, took a, almost four orbits and to get powered up. And then we're ready to go and it got time to undock. So uh, uh, we got in position and, and Mattingly just released us and we floated away. And, uh, See now that to me, when I look at that, it's uh, my heart stops. The idea that you're in this little, you're no longer in a rocket. You're in this strange little it's not very aerodynamic, but since there's no air, I guess it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and you're alone in this thing, in the vastness. Well, well not of really. The two of you. Oh, okay. all right. Yeah, it's not so bad. And we like we're talking. Now that like you mention you and I. it, all right. <laughs> Takes your mind off of everything. Keep talking, man. So you're in this thing, and you have to do a couple of orbits to make your approach, and you almost had to abort that. Uh, Mattingly uh, <clears throat> had a problem. One hour before we were to land on the moon, we were on the backside of the moon, and he had to change his orbit from a, a 60 mile uh, on the backside to 60 miles on the front side, and it required a major engine uh, ignition. Well, he, there was something wrong with the engine. It was sh shaking the, the spacecraft to pieces, so uh, he reported that to John, and John said, don't burn. And when he said that, that means we weren't going to get the land on the next hour. And I don't, I don't know whether your heart can sink to the bottom of your boots in zero gravity, but ours did. And, uh, oh, God, we come this, you know, there's our landing site, eight miles down there. And uh, they about ready to tell us come home. So mission control came up to speed, and, and they started working. Uh, the problem, and uh, they, they came up with an answer on the second revolution around, and the next revolution, the third orbit, we were going, we were cleared to land. Man Manningly made the burn; it all went well, and uh, so now we're cleared to land, and so we started our descent, and it was the last opportunity we had to land because the moon was slowly rotating underneath us and we had to fly cross range to get back to our landing site. And that was the last rev that we could do that with, with the fuel we had on board. So uh, mission control saved the day. 
there's a mo good movie out, uh, uh, a documentary called uh, Mission Control, The Unsung Heroes of Apollo. And it's fantastic. It covers all of the moments that Mission Control saved the day on Apollo. And <clears throat> so uh, uh, we, uh, we landed and uh, uh, Mattingly orbited and we stayed three days. Uh, exploring the moon with a little car. We had the rover. Now, wait, wait, wait. This is so incredible to me. You got to drive before, before we even get to that. So you land. Um, you were the 10th man to walk on the moon. John Young was the ninth. That's correct. So he gets out, you get out. What is that moment like? Because most of us may not get to experience this. <laughs> You are, you are stepping down a ladder to and, stand uh, on yeah, the moon. And, uh, fortunately, the lunar module pilot didn't have to make a big speech. Uh, uh, the commander did That's the, you. Huh? That's you. The, the lunar you're the, you're the pilot. pilot. Yeah. You didn't have I to, didn't make, have a to speech. make a big speech. That's what you're worried about? Uh, no, I, what, I didn't have to do that. Oh, all right. So, uh, okay. so uh, uh, I was just excited. Man, I'm coming down the ladder, and I jumped off the moon and bounced around on the moon, and this thought kept coming, I'm on the moon, I'm on the moon. Wow, golly, look and, at this. And, you know, I was just emotionally. But what's incredible is you really were. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be impossible to communicate, the idea that you were standing on the moon. You, th you dreamt about this and prepared for this, and now you're there. Yeah. Uh, I well it was a uh, emotional high if you will you, you your emotions run from all wonder excitement adventure uh, all of those things rolled into one and I used to say it's it's, it's like a five-year-old on Christmas morning the best Christmas you ever had is the feeling the emotion and the enthusiasm and the excitement you had but you couldn't stand there and you know uh, rub your visor and say, uh, look at this and look at that. You had, you had a checklist and you had to stay on time. Yeah. So it was procedure, procedure, procedure. Okay, so you had, so you, you, you land and now you've got a ton of work to do. Yeah. And, and I didn't realize this, that uh, Armstrong and Aldrin were there 24 hours. You're there three days and you've got rock collecting to do. And it seems crazy to me that you have, uh, what's it called? It's a, it's a, a vehicle, like a dune buggy. Uh, that unfolds from the side of the lunar module, and you get to jump in this sucker and do donuts on the surface of the moon. Well, I didn't drive. I was the navigator. Uh, John, was, John Young was the driver, and it was a great vehicle. It revolutionized lunar exploration because it would uh, go uh, it, will, it would go a hundred kilometers, but you couldn't drive it that far because if you broke down, you had to walk back. So. Uh, <laughs> So our limit was about four miles, and uh, that's still pretty far. Yeah, it is on the moon. Uh, we practiced though, <laughs> and uh, we figured we could walk back four miles. And uh, in those moon boots, yeah, uh -huh. you're probably what I don't know, 150, 180 pounds, and so you. Uh, no, on the moon I weighed 363 pounds with all my. Well, with the gear. Gear on. But one yeah. sixth of that, obviously, yeah. is what you. So you feel like you weigh 60 pounds. 60 pounds, pounds right. So it, it, the, the moon, you get to used to the moon, you know how you can get to practice so much, you know how to make the suit work for you. And you couldn't bend over at the waist, you couldn't bend a knee like this, and uh, like we're sitting here, it's impossible. So you jump into the car and you're like this. <laughs> and it, then you pull over a seat belt and you crank yourself in and it pulls you back into the seat. So now you're looking forward and you, you have a foot well for your feet, and uh, it was fun. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, you, so you got to drive this thing for, um, well, you got to ride in this thing four kilometers from the lunar module. Yeah. And you are collecting rocks and stuff. You and I were talking about this, the geology that you, you um, what, what did you, uh, what was your assignment? I mean, the fact is you're up there and you've got a, you've, you've got a lot of work to do. You're, you're, you're not just there to land. That's been yeah. done before. You're there now to collect 
samples and uh, we had a we had a traverse that was planned by a, a team of geologists and and physicists and all and they gave you at this stop you had this experiment to do and that experiment to do and collect this kind of rock and that kind of rock and uh, take pictures and uh, uh, a 500 millimeter lens and all of these kind of things and so they kept you on on target and on on time and uh, so when you got to a spot you had your checklist and you just started going through the checklist and uh, but they had a TV camera on the car and we just turned it on, pointed the antenna at the earth and then a, this engineer in mission control controlled the camera. And so as they pan it around, they rarely look, were looking at us, they were looking at the terrain. And the, the, the geologist, and we call it the back room, uh, they would see an object, hey, look at that rock over there. Uh, <laughs> Go, guys, go pick up that rock. And so they were telling us which rocks to pick up. And, uh, and so it was a team effort. And uh, we were stayed on schedule. Mission Control kept us on, you know, 40 minutes at this station. Then we'd get jumped back in the car and drive to the next station. I still can't believe you really did this. Can you believe you did this? Yep. Yeah, I do. <laughs> what was it like to leave the moon? Uh, it was an exciting, uh, if you listen to the transcript, the liftoff and uh, uh, t bang, 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 it started just like that and bang, you're off in a, in a big blast of flags waving and you're looking out and uh, you're just going straight up and, uh, and uh, it, was, it was bang, 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 it was controlling it, uh, uh, itself, but uh, it was very, it's like flying a fighter full aileron, bang, you go like this, and then go back the other way. And so it was doing that, and, and you'd listen to the transcript, what a ride, what a ride this is. And you just look out the window when you get a chance, and you see the moon receding, and you just climbing out. And uh, it was uh, it's seven minutes and 50 seconds, 15 seconds, I think. Straight up? No, you go, you start straight up, but then you pitch over. If you go straight up, you could just go straight up and run out of gas and come back down again. <laughs> so you got to pitch over and accelerate to like 3,500 miles an hour. And then what amazes me is then you have to dock with your friend who's been going around the moon for three days alone. And that's, that's hard to fathom, especially with the technology from 50 years ago, that well, you're going yeah. to, it's like two BBs meeting in the air. Yeah. Well, that... Uh, our computer in Apollo had 80K memory. <laughs> My cell phone has 800,000 times that memory. And, uh, and, but there were five, six programs in that computer, and one of them was a rendezvous program. And it, 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 with a series of maneuvers, it just brought you right up in front of the command module and you station kept, and you just hold your position. And then he gets in position, and he, he comes in slowly and, and, and docks uh, with a probe and drogue. And uh, so uh, he, he locks you up. And the only problem was when we got back in orbit, we tracked in maybe two inches of moon dust. And all this dust now is flo floating around in the spacecraft. And uh, it was so bad, we stayed in our, uh, we were supposed to take our helmets off, but it was, so much dust, we just kept everything buttoned up. And so, Mattingly, uh, uh, he, he opens the hatch and looks in and says, you guys aren't coming in here. <laughs> and he closes the hatch again. <laughs> Not, nothing like a practical joker, Qu yeah. quarter of a million miles from home. So, so a, a few minutes later, he opens the hatch again and floats us over a vacuum cleaner. And, uh, <laughs> And we vacuumed up, it's like a little dirt dust devil, and we vacuum all this moon dust up, and then and we not we tell it on the radio, hey Ken, we got it cleaned up. He opens that, she looks, says, okay, come on over. Yeah. You don't have any moon dust in your pockets right now that you'd want to share no, with, uh, with uh, us. I don't have any moon dust. That was illegal to keep I know, any. Yes, I know. Yeah. Um, so you come home from the moon. And um, 
It seems to me, uh, I've had high moments in my life, but not that high. And it seems to me that it would be tough re-entry, uh, not literal re-entry, but metaphorically, uh, yeah. that that's got to be tough because you've done something, um, you know, it's like winning an Oscar, except you realize hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people have won Oscars. Twelve people walked on the moon. So you are, you know, uh, practically revered as a god. You, you land and you're the man who's walked on the moon and uh, the accolades that come with that. So what was your life like? I really want to ask Dorothy, but I, she's not up here right now. <laughs> what is it like now? Now what are you going to do? Yeah, well, that's the question everybody had. Uh, I was 36 and uh, after Apollo was over, I turned 37 and I'd climb the, to the top of the ladder. How do you top a flight to the moon? And everybody got, went through this, what am I gonna do now? What am I gonna do now? And I, I, I couldn't find any peace. Uh, you know, I tried, uh, I started working, well, after Apollo uh, 17, we went to work on that, and then after Apollo was over, uh, uh, what am I gonna do? And what's the, the next challenge, if you will? And so you top at the ladder, and you top of the ladder, and you're 37 years old. You know you got to do something. And so uh, uh, I think everybody, all 12 of us, went through that in some stage or the other. And uh, so uh, I worked on a space shuttle for about three years, and that wasn't challenging. So I took knives off the moon and put them on money. And surely money's going to give me this. <laughs> satisfaction and challenge and unfortunately our marriage was going from bad to worse and we were steaming towards divorce and a lot of astronauts were going through uh, divorce and John Young went through a divorce and uh, anyway uh, things were big uh, going downhill and uh, we were in church but we weren't it was a head knowledge about God you know we were a Christian church and uh, nice people everything like that but we just didn't have that foundation and uh, and so uh, Dorothy got uh, by 1975 uh, she's basically on the verge of suicide and uh, this all is the life I tried everything and my marriage is failing and and uh, this is this life so hurtful why live any longer well, that was her, That was in October of 1975, and uh, she, uh, we, we were in, uh, we were in a little Episcopal church in Laporte, Texas, and one weekend they had what we call Faith Alive, and some people came and shared their faith about the power of Jesus to change a life. And uh, <laughs> so, after that weekend was over, uh, unbeknownst to me, Dottie prayed and said, uh, Jesus, I don't know. She realized she'd tried everything but Jesus. And she prayed that if you're real, God, I give you my life. If you're not, I want to die. And over the next two months, I watched her change from sadness to joy. Amazing change. By this time, we were moving to, uh, moving to Houston. I mean, from Houston to the San Antonio area and uh and i was opening a coors beer distributorship and uh it, which was very successful so the money was pouring in but i was still miserable and uh so after a couple of years Dottie saw this things change and she's changed and says uh and praying for me but not beat me over the head with a bible or anything like that just loving me and uh, and surviving and so uh, uh, she saw the frustration, and so she said, why don't you pray and ask God if he wants you in a beer business? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I, well, I, you know, I, I was a prayer book prayer, you know. I could read, and there wasn't any prayer in a prayer book about. <laughs> and so I said, why don't you pray? And she, you know, prayer was one sentence. It says, God, if you want Charlie in a beer business, give him peace. If you don't want him in a beer business, make it so miserable that he sells out. <laughs> and <clears throat> so... Uh, now, I, now, 
at the reception here that we had the, in this VIP reception, uh, we served moon pies. I want to be very clear. And you grabbed a moon pie and said, these have been my favorite things since I was a kid. Uh, so, and, and you also drank a beer. Yeah. So you, you, didn't, you didn't decide beer is bad. No. You just decided maybe being in the beer distributor business yeah. is not for it you. It was an image problem, I think. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, after that, the, the, the uh, misery got worse, but the, beer, uh, the money got better. So I got a decision to make, you know, do I chase the money or do I chase this internal stalemate, if you will. So I chose to sell, sell out, and, uh, and that was in March of 1978. In, uh, 70, in April, a friend of mine, uh, had, we lived near, New, near San Antonio in a little town, and he invited me to a Bible study at, uh, at, at uh, T-Bar M Tennis Ranch. And uh, we went to this uh, Bible study on uh, Friday night, all day Sunday and all day Saturday and all day Sunday. And I didn't want to go at first because, man, I'm studying the Bible all weekend. Boring, you know, <laughs> golly. But I went and uh, it was the study of, it was the story of Jesus from Genesis to Revelations. And, uh, and it, I went to Sunday school a lot as a kid. And so it, as we were going through and G, the uh, revelation of Jesus as the son of God, these scriptures started coming back to me in a way that was, uh, you know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. If you believe in him, you'll not perish, but have everlasting life. And the thought occurred to me, that's either true or the biggest lie ever perpetrated against humanity. And I get to decide. <laughs> we have decide. free will. And but it's interesting to me because, you know, we're, um, you, you're obviously extraordinarily logical. You didn't get to be an astronaut. Uh, but it's interesting that now you're, you're, you're thinking about bigger things and suddenly that, that verse hits you that I have to deal with this verse. It's a lie or it's true. So what, do you, what did you do? How do you? I, I made a decision uh, that it was true. And I, and I was sitting in my automobile after that weekend with several other scriptures going through my mind. Uh, but all pointing to Jesus as, uh, as the Savior. And I said, Lord, I believe that you are the Savior and come into my life, I give you my life. And uh, no bells and whistles, no angelic voices appear, heard or anything like that, but I knew that I knew that I knew it was the truth. And I had peace inside. And uh, as, as a I sold the business, so I began to just read the Bible, and uh, and I was looking for another job. But I just read the Bible, and the more, the more I did over the next four months, the more established I became that this is the Word of God. And in our church, uh, we go to evangel uh, a uh, liturgical church, uh, uh, and uh, every Sunday after the scriptures are read, it says, uh, "This is the Word of God." We say. And, uh, and so uh, is it the word of God or isn't it the word of God? And I believe it is. And so I put my, I've staked my life on that and it solved my problem with my kids, solved my problem with my wife. It, it gave me a generous spirit. <clears throat> he didn't take away the money. Uh, in fact, the more you give, the more he, he gives. I've, I've, I've seen that. And so the peace of God dwells in our hearts now. We still have troubles, we still battle, and we still have all of these things, but the, the foundation is solid, if you will. And we've built- So you never had a problem being a, a scientist with faith, that was just not an issue for you? No, it's not, a, God is the author of science. Uh, he's a- uh, <laughs> When people ask me that question, what they're really asking, how do you believe in creation and, or evolution? That's the debate. Is creation real or is evolution real? And, and so that's, uh, 
you know, we go to these conferences, uh, Starmus over and it's been around now 10 years or so, and there'll be uh, 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 Dawkins comes and, uh, and Hawkins, Stephen Hawkins comes, and all these Nobel Prize winners, and, uh, and we just debate and talk and, uh, and, so, and love one another. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one of the biggest atheists in the world is probably, I like him, he's a nice guy. He just doesn't believe. And so, uh, uh, <clears throat> it, 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 but the, the, the whole debate is over evolution versus creation, I believe. And that's really what they're asking. And I, you can't prove either one. You cannot write a scientific experiment or a scientific equation that proves the existence of evolution, or can you do that for creation? So it's a matter of faith. What are you gonna believe? And I choose, and God, uh, God spoke to me, when I say spoke to me, not into my ears, but into my heart, as I was reading the creation account, God said, which are you gonna believe, this or what they say? decision. I said, I can't prove it, Lord, but I will believe you. Well, what, what interests me also, though, is that you, when people talk about faith, a lot of times, you know, we talk about the intellectual side, but you had an experiential side. Uh, in other words, your marriage was failing. You were miserable. Uh, Dorothy was miserable. And as a result of this, that changed, which itself is Extraordinary. It is. The idea that you could suddenly go from being miserable and hopeless to being full of purpose and, and, and joy. And I, I take it your marriage survived. 59 years tomorrow. <laughs> it's, uh, everybody always says the first 59 years are the toughest, so I think you're out of the woods. <laughs> I think you're out of the woods tomorrow. Um, uh, well, it's, uh, I was, uh, my son Tom's here too, and uh, he and his uh, family follow the Lord. His older brother follows the Lord. They both came to the Lord about a year after we did. And I was a military drill instructor dad and, uh, in those days, and God, God convicted me from Scripture. And uh, I was demanding on them, I, and, uh, uh, you know, it's like a military drill instructor dad and uh and <clears throat> and i'd uh shamed them in every way else to make them do what i wanted them to do and uh and i was reading in the proverbs and the uh, proverb says you have the power of life and death in your tongue it's a powerful statement you can speak life or you can speak death <clears throat> and it's your decision and so uh, God spoke to my heart and says, you have cursed your own children. And I don't mean uh, profanity. That's not what the Bible taught when it says curses. You're stupid, that's a curse. And, uh, and so I repented, I was in tears. And I said, God forgive me, and I went to the boys, and Tom was a little boy at the time, he, well maybe nine or 10, 13 or so. And he looks up and says, that's okay, Dad. And we begin to build our relationship on a godly foundation. It changed our whole family. And, uh, and now they're raising their kids in the same way, and I haven't cursed them since. <laughs> <laughs> I get angry sometimes, but, uh, but now we got nine grandchildren, we're expecting great-granddaughter uh, in August. And, we're blessing the socks off of our <laughs> grandchildren. Well, I wanted to end on a positive note, and we failed, obviously. Um, this is so wonderful. Um, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, time flies. Um, but, um, Charlie, I, I just want to say I'm so honored that you would grace us with your presence, and Dorothy also, uh, on the eve of your 59th wedding anniversary. What you did 50 years ago uh, is something that, without any question, um, it makes me very proud to be an American. And I remember 
uh, when you and the other astronauts returned from space watching the splashdown. And just as a kid with my mom and dad watching this stuff, just having tears in our eyes mm -hmm. at what it is possible to accomplish uh, and how, how meaningful it is and how beautiful it is. And even 50 years later, most people, if they're familiar with it, they, they're in awe that, that human beings were able to do this. But I think I'm a, I'm a little bit more in awe of the fact that uh, the, the rest of your story uh, points beyond human accomplishment and that you are uh, so gentle and kind and, and that you've spent the rest of your life uh, talking about the one who made the moon uh, and the earth. So um, since we're out of time, let me simply say thank you for everything you've done and for uh, being with us uh, here. I want to say to the folks here, uh, we will do more of these events uh, in the fall, probably not with any more astronauts. I'm sorry to, to tell you <laughs> that uh, this is it. But uh, I, um, I know that uh, we, we have a patron's dinner, and anybody who um, has to go to that, we're going to do that. But uh, Charlie, just in closing, let me say thank you uh, so have, much. I, may I have a closing statement? Uh, you may, sir. OK. <laughs> Uh, my daddy was born in 1907, four years after the Wright brothers, and uh, he saw me walk on the moon, and it was, he couldn't believe it, that his son walked on the moon. He'd see, think about that, from the Wright brothers to the moon in a little over 60 years. And, uh, and, uh, Tom and his brother, when they were young, they didn't think it was any big deal. <laughs> the, the, whole, the whole neighborhood was going to the moon. <laughs> Our next door neighbor was Bill Anders. Neil Armstrong lived a block behind us. <laughs> Frank Borman lived in the neighborhood. Stu Russo lived in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, John Young lived in the neighborhood. Uh, Tom Stafford lived in the neighborhood. I mean, we're all going to the moon, the whole neighborhood. And, uh, but uh, I tell that as, in a, a joking way, but uh, what's the important part is that we were, we were carrying our kids, if you, if you will envision it as climbing a mountain. My dad climbed a mountain and he could see that next mountain, he took me there, and I could see a mountain farther on. And, uh, and I think our kids, we have a responsibility to the generations that follow to encourage them and inspire them and to aim high and dream big. And it's, if, if we don't do it, nobody's gonna do it. And uh, so we need to uh, 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 keep, keep a focus, encourage our kids in, in, uh, to, to, as an Air Force model, aim high. And, uh, and I think that's very important for us. So uh, have at it, grandmamas and granddaddies. Thank you so much.